If you hire someone and they're not really strong at the role on day one, you are setting them up to fail. Like the status quo is that they won't figure it out and they'll fail. And then you've wasted your money and time. They've wasted their career. That's really bad for everybody. Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Ian, last week, when we were talking about changing the brand of our show, we got ridiculed because Alexandra said to us, what? You have to like change the side on the side of a building or something? Like, What's the big deal about changing your brand, guys? Well, today's guest would actually have a problem if he changes his brand because he does have a sign on the side of a building, which I think is, goes a long way for credibility in my book. Today's guest is Jason Cohn. And for me, one of my all-time favorite single author blogs, A Smart Bear, and one of the most thoughtful people, both in writing and in person, on the topic of business that I've ever met. I can just say hands down. Wow. That's a hell of an intro. You know, Jason, when you're talking with him in person, I have so many moments when I was like, man, that's a, wow, that's a great idea. And he's not scared to challenge you either. You say something dumb and Jason, in the kindest way, will just say, let me give you a smarter alternative right now. (laughs) He listens, he's engaging, and he is this week's guest on the podcast. That's right. Jason Cohn grew up in Austin and still lives there today and has been coding since high school. So he is the founder of WP Engine, which we use for this blog. Are we going into an ad section now? Is this an ad segment? We got no discount. Our bill's massive. (laughs) (laughs) No discount. Jason not once offered a discount, which uh, I think uh, proves his business acumen. Still happy to pay it. (laughs) So WP Engine provides managed WordPress hosting. So he saw an opportunity to create a SaaS around this growing movement of WordPress sites on the internet. And he's got hundreds of employees and a building in downtown Austin. Quite the incredible company. But that's not what this episode's all about today. A few years ago, Jason actually gave up the CEO role of a WP Engine for reasons that we're going to talk about in today's episode. Before WP Engine, Jason founded and exited from a few other software companies. So he's got a track record, most notably Smart Bear. And again, his amazing blog, check it out, blog.asmartbear.com. The articles are timeless. Jason also was the keynote at our recent conference in Austin, and he's, we're going to expound on some of the topics that he touched on on the stage, like the angst you can feel after you sell a business, deciding where and how to invest your time and your resources. And I have a note here that says, quiet giant. I think that's your note. <laughs> I just think that Jason is one of those guys that is a quiet giant, man. He's doing amazing things, and you probably wouldn't know it unless you dug in. The guy has his logo on a building in the center of downtown Austin. (laughs) I begin by asking Jason where he gets his motivation from. How do you get a sign on the side of a building (laughs) in downtown Austin? I've never had a plan for my whole life type of thing. I've definitely always wanted to make money, which is a very selfish and egotistical and narrow thing, but who cares? <laughs> I think if more people were honest outwardly, they'd admit that's, that's what drives them too. So that's always been a factor. I've always, it's been hard to have a real job. I don't like having a boss and all that. So I'm sure everyone listening to this can <laughs> would agree with that feeling too. So it's just been there. So it wasn't a big plan. It was just, this is something where this works. And I was learning a lot. And I didn't really give it a lot more thought or strategic thought or career thought than that. For me, it went like this. I went to college. I got out of college. I started designing products. And then I had what I would call the corner office test, which I looked in the corner office and I said, do I want to be like my boss? Do I want to be like that guy? And the answer was no. I don't want to work at a company. I want to own a company. And so did you have a moment like that where you realized I don't want to have a boss? And what did that seem like to you? I did. But on the other hand, again, it wasn't so premeditated. Like It was just more when there was an opportunity not to. 
I took it and it felt right. And I've just always been able to continue to make new things. You know, WP Engine, my current company, is the fourth startup that I've made. And fortunately, and you can you can argue how much is luck and how much is skill, of course, but fortunately, they've been successful enough that one led to the next and was sold for enough money that it you know funded the ability to do the next one and so forth. So I haven't had to have a real job. Although I guess you could argue that I've created a real job for myself here at WP Engine. We're um, over 450 people now, so there's only real jobs here, I think, <laughs> no matter what your position or title is. Also, you know, we say things like, I want to be my own boss. That's kind of true when you're one person and have no family. But even if you have just a couple of employees and, and you're the boss, it doesn't work in the way that you were hoping. Like you're, you were thinking, I'll, I get to do whatever I want, but you have your employees' best interests at heart. And so you really are acting in a way that helps them and is in relation to them. And same thing with your customers. They're kind of the boss. You got to do things, you know, if, if they're not happy, it doesn't matter. And so very quickly, even with a boot, small bootstrap company, you realize I'm the boss. But on the other hand, like I kind of feel beholden to a lot of people already. And then of course, with the more employees you get, that's more. If you have investors, that's more. But even without the whole investor thing, never mind that. I don't think you ever quite feel like you have no shackles and there's nothing holding you down. You can just do what you want. I don't think that is quite how it feels. You kind of are doing a little bit more of what you want though these days, right? Because you fired yourself from being the CEO of WP Engine fairly recently, right? Well, four years ago. You had to make a decision. And this is one of the things you came and talked at uh, DC Austin, which we're very grateful about. You explained the process that you went through in your mind to figure out, hey, I'm not the right person for this. Every human, whether it's an employee at a big company or you're a sole founder somewhere, Everybody deserves to be in a place where they more or less like the stuff that they're doing. They're enjoying the work. Not every day, every second of every day. Some work is grunt work, but you more or less enjoy the work. Your skills and talents, their strengths are being put to use. Of course, you're still growing too. That means growing means you're getting better at something that you were not as good at before, but still you're mostly in your area of strength. So it feels good. And that the company needs, like you might be great at chess and you like it, but the company doesn't need you to be good at chess. So that's not helpful. So for me, there were various things about being a CEO of a larger company. By here, it was like 70, 80 people when we finally made that transition, where in some aspects, it was those three things, but in other aspects, it wasn't. And there was enough other aspects there was going to get worse over time. As we get to hundreds of people and so on, some of those things are going to be worse. So for example, hiring and, and managing and holding to account a global sales team, not three people who all really know the product and are selling, but uh, say 50 or 80-person internationally located sales team. That's interesting to me. In fact, I think all the things we do are interesting, but that's different than saying, I want the responsibility to go build that and hold them accountable and figure out how to make that work. That was not exciting. I felt dread on something like that. And yet, of course, that's what the company needs. So I absolutely had the option of, of staying as a CEO, but I didn't have the desire to do that. And Obviously, what's optimal for the company is for you to have the very best people you can at each of the positions that the company has open. Obviously, that you have a position open for a reason, so you want the best talent. So you can have someone, whether it's yourself or another employee who's filling that role and growing or figuring out it as they go along. And that's okay. And the smaller the company is, the more that has to be true for a lot of positions. There's no choice. As you grow, though, that's suboptimal. And in fact, as you grow even to 10 people, much less 100, if that's still happening at large or at, in important positions, then you're doing a bad job in designing your organization because you're hamstringing your organization by having too many people learning as they go or, or sort of fumfering around instead of being 10x better than that, which is what the company presumably needs. You know, That's how I felt I was going to be at too many things that I also didn't have the passion for. So when you add all that up, now, it sounds very cold and calculated now. Obviously, it's in a very emotional decision. It's mostly an emotional decision. So I don't mean to say that, that was easy, but that is the intellectual side of the decision. You brought up two uh, interesting things, and I want to get to the second one in a minute here, which is how to hire the right people. But to get back to the first idea, I think you called it like your superpowers concept. Okay, so the idea of the superpowers concepts is, is basically finding a thing within you that you have energy for and that you're really good at. And then there's some other things that you're pretty good at. Like you said, I could probably be okay at building a sales team, but I don't have a lot of passion for it. How do we identify the things that we're really good at? Because most of the time, I think people are bad at this. Like they'll say, well, I'm really good at this and they'll end up not being that great at it. So for you, how do you identify the things that you are truly great at? 
so I think the more experience you have, the more that you realize how little you are truly great at. In other words, people who say like, I don't need a sales team or, you know, this is fine. They probably have not worked with great salespeople. They probably only worked with mediocre or worked with no salespeople before. So that's why they have that opinion. Same thing with marketing. A lot of founders think, well, I obviously can write the best marketing copy because I'm the founder. I mean, I'm the best salesperson as well because I'm the passionate, knowledgeable founder. And it is true that, that a passionate, knowledgeable person, period, who talks about something they enjoy for 45 minutes is in general a good salesperson because it's catching. But that is not sales and that's not marketing. And if you think that that, that makes you great, you have not worked with a really terrific marketer or, or brand person or advertiser or a salesperson or you can go down the list. So I think, first of all, just, just to recognize, like, the answer is you're not the best person probably at almost anything but one or two things. And once you realize that, it's a little easier to narrow down what it is because the answer isn't 12 things. The answer is really just one or two. So the way you find out is this. You ask, what are the things where if I do it all day, I lose track of time, and after 14 hours of doing it straight, not only am I not exhausted, but what I want to do is take a quick break and go back to it, and I can't stop thinking about it. Those things, th those are probably it. There's actually quite few things that where it's that extreme, but that's what's meant by a superpower. I want to get on the second part of that concept, which is you said, you know, most of us aren't very good at a lot of things. And most of us also haven't worked with very good marketers or finance people. You have another concept, and that's the idea of identifying these people and hiring these people. But there's a problem, and that's if you're not good at it, how can you identify somebody that is good at it? Right. So you can't. So how would you identify a pancreatic surgeon who's really good? And the answer is you right. can't. You don't know how, what to ask, and you're not going to read a blog post and then know what to ask and then analyze that, dig in. You're not going to. Although, interestingly, it turns out that people's ratings of their doctors and whether they like them is not correlated with outcomes, with medical outcomes. So it's actually, while doctors are often evaluated that way, especially in hospitals, it's actually not correlated with their abilities or, or the outcomes, which is really the only thing that matters in health care. Is if, you, if I gave you two doctors, one of them had great bedside manner, you loved the guy, and then there's another woman, and she had terrible bedside manner, but she got better outcomes for you, and you have cancer, which one do you want? Of course, you want the outcomes. So that's actually the solution to the question. You do not figure out who's best at the skill with questions. Instead, you have to ask, who's going to deliver the outcomes? If it's an advertiser, I want to know who's going to deliver the leads, the leads that actually convert, or the direct conversions off the website, or whatever it is that their, their job is going to be. Or if it's in sales, who, who does that? Or if it's in product, who's able to find out what the market needs and build it, you know, right? Like those kind of things. So how do you figure that out? And the answer is you want someone who is already oriented to care about outcomes. So what does that mean? That means what they value and what they are proud of is the outcomes that they create rather than what they do, the details of what they do. So for example, let's say it's an event planner. That's a pretty specific job, but it's really easy to show the example. So the event player who cares about the event says stuff like, oh, I had this great event. We had all this cool stuff. The food was really good. I got a good deal from this caterer, so it got under budget. And a lot of people came and, and, and people said they had a good time. So that is someone who cares about the event. Are they a good event planner? Who knows? The outcome-oriented event planner says, yeah, we threw an event. It came in under budget. It generated 200 leads and 40 of them closed. And the sales team uh, just harangued me about how often we could do these events. And I was like, well, if you do them too often, you know, it's, it's too much. So I don't know. We decided to do it uh, every six months. So that's outcome-oriented. Who cares what was at the event? Did it work? <laughs> what was the point of the event? Did that work? How do you know? Well, you, you simply see how, what the person talks about. <laughs> Which things are they proud about? You can even ask them, what were you proud about? Or you can even be more direct. What outcome did the event have? What results did you drive? You can be that direct. And, you know, the person doesn't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. Or I generated leads. Well, how many closed? I'm not sure. So that's not a person who cares about the outcome. So you can specifically ask around the outcomes to see what's the deal. Because as the manager of the person, you also should not and will not micromanage them. If you hire a fantastic, say, a salesperson, you're not going to sit there with Salesforce open and nitpick every call and email they send. Instead, you need them to produce. You're going to hold them to a quota. That's all. You're going to hold the marketing person to leads and the salesperson to a quota and the designer to make beautiful things that they cause fewer support tickets because it's clear how to use the software or whatever. So that's how you're going to measure the person anyway. That's how you should measure the person anyway is through the results that they, the impact they have to the business, the customers, and so on. That's how they should be measured anyway so that you're giving them the freedom and the power and empowered to go do their thing, which is to invent stuff and 
figure out how to solve the problem and generate the results. Like that's the fun part of any job is to figure that stuff out and then prove you're right by implementation. And the same thing's even true in your own area of expertise. Just because you may be the star engineer, and maybe you are, right, but you still want to hire another star engineer, of course. But you don't want to stomp on them and do all their design work for them and all their architecture work. That's all the fun part. <laughs> you don't want to steal that from them, do you? No, you want to hold them to account for, of course, creating the right stuff and, and so on. So it's the right way to manage and hire anybody. And in particular, it's a way to do it for someone where you wouldn't know how to micromanage them even if you wanted to. As I understand it now, you're in charge of the product side of WP Engine. Can you share a little bit about your hiring process and what that might look like if I came through that? So there's different things we look for. Culture fit, obviously, is a big one. And so there's a whole set of questions and probes that are really around culture, which we're very explicit about. We have it encoded, and when you walk in the front door, it's on the wall. And a lot of companies, I guess, do that, but then don't live it, right? So you actually have these words on your walls, and people use them in your office and in, within your company. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Empathy is important. Empathy means automatically putting yourself in someone else's shoes and seeing the world from their eyes. So the best interview question I've ever heard about empathy is from Southwest Airlines. And what they do is they put candidates in a circle facing each other in, on chairs, and then they take turns telling stories about a time that was difficult or embarrassing or, or hard. And what they're doing is watching the people who are listening to the story because the people with empathy are going like this. This is radio, so you're making a scrunched up face. I'm just going to explain that for everybody. Yeah, you can see it on their face and their body language that they're reacting because they're, that's what empathy looks like, that you're, you're feeling it as they're telling it. You can ask even literally, like, you know, tell me about a difficult time or time you had challenges, you know, and see if they talk about how other people are feeling or what it was like for others. Or they're like, yeah, I guess it was, I guess it was bad for them, which is sort of mid, mid-level. And then best would be something like, Oh, let me tell you, it was terrible for them too. I really feel bad for them. Oh, yeah. Like that's best, right? So you can see that spectrum. As long as you, again, you have to know what you're looking for. Are you looking for empathy or you don't care? You don't have to care about empathy. But if you know what kinds of specific things you're looking for as we do, then, then you can prod. In general, using questions that talk about high stakes or high emotional state events, those are helpful in sussing out what's going on. If you ask someone something like, let's say it's a manager, what's your management philosophy? Oh, I think, you know, you should support people. And I don't know, they'll just say things that sound nice. That's not really telling you anything. So better questions, for example, over a manager would be something like, well, so here's an okay question. You have a problem person who is good at their job, but they're culturally a problem. How do you handle that? Because you have to, you know, bring that up in a certain way. You have to find out if the person is willing to try to change and or they're not. And even that, you can probably guess at what a decent answer would be. So here's a hard question. I love this question for managers. Let's say you have someone in the organization and they're they're fine. They're kind of middle of the road. They're not bad at anything. They're not like a superstar, but you know you can't have a hundred people and they're all superstars. So they're they're good. They're good culture fit. They do their job. You know, in the first three months hiring them, you're like, okay. Now fast forward two years and they're exactly the same. No problems. No improvement. Is that okay? Can this person remain in the organization or not? And what do you do? Now, see, that's a tricky one. (laughs) You could see either side of that. This now brings up your real philosophy as a manager. It causes you to start thinking about performance versus humanity. There are some companies like Rackspace where the answer is always help the person because that's their their culture. Help the person. Continue. If they're disruptive and everything, that's different. But if they're not, then our job is to help someone thrive. And, of course, there's, there's the other way that says, look, ultimately everyone has to be growing. And if you're not growing, then then we can't invest in you. Yeah, that's actually a cultural problem if you're not growing because growth is part of our culture. Everyone's getting better. And if that's not the case, then uh, this isn't a place to coast. There's lots of jobs for you if you want to coast. It's fine. You're not a bad person. But this isn't a coast place. This is a grow place. Part of why it's okay that we make mistakes is because it's part of growth. Either one of those two things I just said is perfectly fine. There's not a right or wrong. But for your business, there should be a right or wrong. One of those is correct for your business. So trying to nail down what are these things. This is your culture, by the way. All we're doing is saying you decide your culture so that you can interview for it. Those are examples. So I bring those up to answer your general question about interviews because any one question about technology or marketing, that's not really germane. And there's a million blog posts about technical questions to ask. I don't think that's very helpful. You can read that. But these other questions around who is this person and do they fit? That's much harder. So those are some very specific examples. So what I'm hearing is hiring for attitude probably before aptitude in the case of your process. It depends. I think 
there are times where you can hire someone who can't do the job well yet. That's hiring for attitude, not aptitude, and you can teach them. We do that with support, for example. But part of why we can do that in our support team is that we have an entire learning and development team also with curriculum. All new hires and support go through a, a several month course that includes first classroom and courses, then on the floor with a buddy and the whole system, and then blah, 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 until they're on their own. We have that whole process in the company. Therefore, we can hire for aptitude. We can't teach attitude, but we can hire for aptitude and train because we, we literally have that process built to do it. So that is our strategy because we have the right process for it. But if this is employee number one or even number 10, you have zero processes to help someone. And every seat is valuable. That's true of any company. It's even more true of a bootstrap company where there's no dollars that you can waste. You have fewer than 10 people. Every single person needs to material to change the business, whether it's growth or whatever it is. They have to. So the idea of hiring someone who, well, they'll come in, they're cheap, they can't really do a great job, but they'll learn. Like, actually, we don't have time for that shit. And so how do you balance that? Because it's, I think it's different in a 10-person company, right? When you maybe don't have a lot of budget, you don't have a lot of expertise in a lot of these different areas, right? And so you have to kind of cobble together a team, hopefully, of superheroes with superpowers. But that probably changes, right, when you have 300 employees. Well, there are more roles. So in other words, I'll give you an example. I'm not being wishy-washy <laughs> by saying this. I'll, 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 give you, I'll be specific. There's such a thing as an engineer who by himself, does not produce code at a prodigious rate. But whatever team that person is on, that whole team gets better. They go faster, their code is better, they're happier. Even though that one person is not the producer of it, the people around them and the team as a whole get better. And you dig in and you realize they're spending half their time pair programming. They're mentoring that junior person. That junior person on the team is coming up really fast and progressing way faster than you'd expect. Oh, this person's mentoring them. Well, what's the value of that? It exists. What if that's true of several people? What if they're causing you know the code quality to be higher and then there's the crazy person in the corner who no one wants to talk to because they're super smart, but they also produce a lot of unmaintainable code and this person helps that change because they can kind of level with that person and fix it. Is that an employee number one person? No. That is not a role, as to your point, that is not a role that's okay at a 10 person company. At a 450 person company, is that an acceptable role? Well, we can't have half the department be that way. <laughs> but actually, if there's a few people where that's the case, that's powerful. So I do not think it's okay to hire someone who can't do the job on day one. I think you're setting them up to fail. And I don't care if you have a thousand people or one person. If you hire someone and they can't, they're not really strong at the role on day one you are setting them up to fail. Like the status quo is that they won't figure it out and they'll fail. And then you've wasted your money and time. They've wasted their career. Like that's really bad for everybody. I think you have to go in believing. Now you could be wrong because you're interviewing. So obviously you can be wrong. That's different. But you have to go in believing you're hiring someone where this they're in an area of strength and you know what that is and you need that strength. And they're growing in some areas. Again, you think you know what that is. Now, of course, then reality unfolds and you see where you're at and you deal with it. But you've got to go in with that, not going in saying, well, this person was cheap. So although they've never done AdWords before, they're hungry and they're cheap. So let's try it. To me, even with bootstrapping and saying, I don't have the money, I don't buy that argument. I've seen a lot of companies do that and then not grow. So, okay, you haven't spent that much money. Also, it was all wasted anyway. And just to be clear... WP Engine raised a lot of money, that's true. All four of the companies I started were bootstrapped, all of them, including WP Engine. I raised money after two years. It was going to be another, well, it was for the first two years, another bootstrap company. So, yes, I've raised money now, but what I'm saying, I, I built four bootstrap companies with this mindset that just uh, getting a crappy person for less is not worth it. This week's show is sponsored by DCBKK. Hey, that's us. How much is this costing? That's right. That's We're us. We're sponsoring our own show. We want right. to get the word out about our annual event. Every year, our Big Bash in October, hundreds of entrepreneurs descend on the amazing city of Bangkok to share in meetups, knowledge sharing, masterminds, keynotes, evening parties, and a whole lot more. I can't wait. This is practitioners. These are people around the globe that are running businesses that are changing the lives of people around them. We all come to learn from each other under one roof. 
and it's going to be amazing. I feel like this is going to be our best year yet. And part of the reason DCBKK is unique is that you must qualify to attend. That's right. You have to be an established entrepreneur in order to attend. Every year, Ian, we open up a small percentage of the tickets to the public to invite people to see the community and to meet their peers and to meet other inspiring entrepreneurs who've done the unique, crazy, and difficult things that you've managed to do, which is to grow a successful online business. If that describes you, we'd love to see you in Bangkok in October. All the details are at dcbkk.com. So Ian, before this podcast, we were talking about cutting deals on cars. Have you ever cut a bad deal with an employee to save a couple bucks and end up paying for it in the end. Mm-hmm. You get yourself a, a lemon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Several times. It's easy to just think about the money and not to think about the value and to try and make something happen for less than you should, for sure. Speaking of things that are, I think, pretty difficult for most bootstrapped entrepreneurs to talk about, because we do look at the books. We do look at the product, the revenue, the numbers, this and that. But there's this word that sort of starts to pop up amongst the most successful among us. And this word is culture, specifically company culture. The way a lot of people talk about it's kind of this vague thing and you're not really sure. How do you do culture? What is it, you know? Yeah. It's something that Jason takes super seriously. So we wanted to talk about that. And I mean, he doesn't take it seriously for fun, right? It's because he thinks it works. Yeah. As Jason explains, it has to come from the founder, which I think in the case of WP Engine, it does. So... I asked Jason when it started to happen, you know, how did he start to build a culture in his company? What was the turning points for him and how did this come about? I had just seen a great presentation about culture by Mikey Trafton at Business of Software. And I want to say the year was maybe 12 or 13. I don't remember, but you can look up Business of Software, Michael Trafton culture, and I'm sure you'll find it because they have those old videos up so you could watch it. So I was inspired by that because I'd, I'd heard a lot about culture. And you know, nowadays, we're sort of inundated with people saying culture matters. But even just five years ago, that wasn't the case. It was still new to even think about it. And I actually had the attitude that culture is bullshit. That, that this is a weak thing that people who like, eh, it matters. Like, just shut up and do your work. Work harder. <laughs> Don't worry about that, right? Like the culture of beanbags and foosballs tables. That's what you thought was a... That's like benefits. And I just mean just even the touchy-feely stuff. This sounds like something that the HR department at a big company does because they need things to do besides, you know, manage the medical system. This makes them feel like they're doing something valuable. And we don't need to do that because we're different and we're small. And so we can say that's dumb. So that was my attitude. So this was the first, this presentation was the first time I saw something about culture where I thought, actually, that makes a lot of sense to me. Also, I reflected back on my previous company, Smart Bear, after hearing this talk and realized, once again, I didn't have any, you know, there's no culture on the wall. We didn't think about it. And as a result, you know, every company has a culture. The question is, did you decide what it was or did it just form? And there were some things in retrospect that I liked about our culture at Smart Bear. I wouldn't have changed and other things I would have changed and was bad. For something to happen that's important about the company. And the only reason it's that way is because you just didn't think about it. That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you should decide what it is and try to work on it. Like if it matters, it shouldn't just happen to you. So I had a kind of a moment where I fi- it finally came through to me through a great presentation. This is not bullshit. Even if half of it is, I mean, even if you have three employees, like these are their lives at any given time, this is the best years we have. Cause we're only getting older, all of us. Right. So this is the best, whatever of the years they have left, these are their best ones <laughs> right now. All three employees, what are we doing with that? Like, that's a pretty deep, important question. And and we think about what do we do as entrepreneurs, no matter how small or big the company is, doesn't matter. What are we doing? We're making these products that in 100 years, none of them will matter. So what are we really doing? The things that we can do for a customer or employee as people, that could be some of the most important and enduring and lasting things that we ever do. So we should all try to make lots of money. I still want to do that. (laughs) But what we can do for others, and what we are doing at WP Engine, and at Smart Bear I did a little bit, but now we're intentional. It's all different. Why wouldn't you want to have that impact in in the world? That's something. That's a thing that that a company can do. So what I'm hearing is it kind of feels silly, right? When you first start a company and you have like two or three people or maybe just yourself, it kind of feels silly to be that decisive about a culture, right? And you're like, dude, we're just hanging out. We're having a good time. So... What's your recommendation and when to start? Well, I don't know. A lot of people will say you can't when it's early because it's too awkward. 
what do we believe in? It's like, uh, dude, I don't know. <laughs> right? We believe in trying to make this work. <laughs> so there's the argument that it's not time yet to worry about that when it's two people. But there are companies who decide that up front. So when we formed it at 30 people, it was written in stone. Like we don't change the values. We actually, a year ago, so a three-year anniversary, we revisited it and decided to change nothing. Now, if you're really little, I think maybe be okay to do it, write it down, but actually be okay changing it because it's so young, the company is so young, and there's not enough people to really know how you're going to feel when there's 10 or, or more people. So maybe write it down, but allow yourself to morph that thing. But it isn't necessarily bad to have the discussion over beers and say, if we had someone who was the best designer ever, but no one else liked them and we had to lock them in a room, would we do that or not? That's an interesting question because it's easy to say, oh, no, because everyone's on the team. But actually, you could totally have a culture where that's acceptable, especially if, like many modern and small companies, you're a distributed workforce. If that person is physically not in the room and, in fact, no one does have to interact with that person much, it might be okay. Because the culture should only be the stuff where you're absolutely sure it's a deal breaker. If you're on the fence, then it just doesn't go in there. It's a judgment call in that case. It's not a culture thing. Write down some of those things, but let it be more fluid when it's young, don't let yourself get too locked in. Once you start scaling the hiring practice, it does need to be locked in. There needs to be like, this is the strategy or this is the, these are the rules. You've brought it up two times. So let's just talk about it before we move on. And that's money. You said part of your motivation when you're younger and part of your motivation now is money. Explain what money does for you. Well, I mean, it's all the obvious stuff. You know, they say money can't make you happy, but it can make a lot of things go away. You know, and so that's what it does. It makes things go away. But with selling Smart Bear, uh, that's already the case for me. I've already achieved that level of personal wealth. So, so at this point, I think it's just DNA at this point of just that is a drive. It's not because then I can buy this. In fact, after I sold Smart Bear, we didn't get a new house. I didn't get a new car. We didn't do any of those kind of things because we don't actually care about material things. I was driving a Mini Cooper. I continued driving it for five more years until it was a total of 11 years old and finally got a new car. But that's because it literally was too old. So actually, it's not really, it's not materialistic. The obvious answers are things like freedom and, and, you know, sleeping at night and not worry about this so that you can do things that you can, essentially, you can indulge the things you want to do. I mean, that's, that's the typical answer. Of course, what I did is I ended up starting another company. So apparently that's what I wanted to do anyway. And so that's, that's maybe a good thing to keep in mind is that that's probably what you want to do anyway. The thing you're doing now is probably the thing that you would do anyway. And if that's true, then now is the time to enjoy the thing that you're doing and not say, well, look, after I make a whole bunch of money, then I will be able to enjoy life. That's the wrong attitude. First of all, that may not come. Even if it does come, this kind of thing that you're doing now is probably the thing that you're going to do. So this is when you should enjoy life right now. You mentioned a couple of times now selling a smart bear and you've sold, I think two companies before that a smart bear and it watchdogs. And then you started uh, WP engine after smart bear. Right. And when you're in Austin where you live, but at the event, you brought up this idea that it might not be the right decision to sell your company. Do you feel like all the companies that you've sold, it's been the right decision? Oh, for sure. You know, that's probably luck because it's very, very easy to find examples of people who regret it. The answer is all of the above happens and it's difficult to know in the moment what to do. And if you didn't start WP Engine, would you still probably feel like that? I mean, that's kind of a hard question to answer. No, it's easy. Because in the in this couple of years after I sold Smart Bear, but before I even had the idea for WP Engine, it was already felt like the right thing. And if I understand the timeline, you took a couple of years off after Smart Bear? Your daughter was being born at that time. Right. You know, I'm in that situation. And I know some of the listeners on the show are in that situation. And I have an immense feeling of guilt not going right back to work, even though financially that doesn't need to happen right away. How did you feel during that time off? I was glad to have the blog. I had been blogging for a while then, and it was getting popular. And so that was nice to have a project that did not have a deadline or requirements or anything. Therefore, I could work on it whenever. Guilt. It's interesting to ask, what is guilt? Usually guilt is a backward-looking emotion. In other words, guilt is something happened I'm mad at myself about it. The guilt isn't being mad at someone else. It's being mad at yourself. You're mad at yourself because what? Because you think you should be creating value, maybe making money, but probably more like building an asset, whether that's reputational, like doing this, because if you if you leave off this for a few months, then the viewership will go down and I don't know, various things, and then you'll have to get back to it. 
And also, we're, we're sort of trained to think of assets of having exponential value. So if I take one year off, that actually halves the amount of money that I'll make in eight years. Or like, Even if this isn't a conscious thought, this is the kind of way that you're thinking about why it's bad to take a year off. On the other hand, I dare you to find someone, even someone who's type A, go to hell, everything like you and I and probably all your listeners are. I dare you to find someone like that who took six or 12 months off. And whatever that meant for them, they traveled, they had a kid, they painted you know there's different ways people they got into iron man i don't know there's different things people do when they when they step away from their type a asset building attitude find me someone who took a year off who regrets it yeah in your experience most people don't most people do not regret it they don't say well i took a year off i got myself healthy got my head on straight got sleep developed some good habits got into running then i started a company man i wish i hadn't done all that Mm-hmm. Or, gee, I wish I, I wish I hadn't spent all that time with my daughter. If that's true, then that tells you that's a good idea. And because you're automatically drawn to do stuff, that's your, in your DNA to do stuff, you will go do stuff. That's what's going to happen. If you want a more intellectual ar- argument, it would be this. The way to get the best ideas and the best opportunities, whether it's partnering with someone else or a new idea for your own business, or what, whatever opportunities means, right? The way to get the best ones is if you have time and lots of options. That's how you get the best option. Like the worst thing is when you say you have to get a job in two weeks, then you're almost guaranteed to get a shitty job. (laughs) You don't have time to go seek out the good stuff. Some things, by the way, are serendipitous. The best thing might happen in three and a half months. And the only way to get there is if you're not doing anything in three and a half months and therefore you're available. So when you have time on your side and you're allowed to do nothing and be available. Let's say, not do nothing, you'll do something, but you're available. If you're available for a, the next year and you're open, and since you're not heads down on some asset, you can be open to things and talking to people about what they're doing because maybe there's an opportunity there, or having these kind of conversations which sparks ideas and who knows what. And that maximizes the chance that the best idea and opportunity appears and that you're available for. How many more of these six, seven year chunks do you think you have left in your life? Meaning like no one can predict, but how much energy do you have to do this again? I can't even think about that right now. Like right now, the answer is never again. (laughs) (laughs) What I would guess is that I probably would not want to be the operator again right away in a startup just because it's so all in energy and time. And it would probably be better to be involved, but not leave the meeting with to do's. (laughs) So... That implies things like investment, advising, boards, things like that. I started doing angel investing in 2009 after selling Smart Bear and Capital Factory, uh, an incubator here in Austin, got started. And so I was one of the original investors and mentors there. So was Michael Trafton, who did that culture thing I, I mentioned. That was fun. So I could I could imagine doing that, you know, getting back into that world of helping other people with their companies, both with money and advice, of course and helping some more companies grow here in Austin. Like that's what I'm thinking. Let's talk about that for a minute because it's a very different skill set than building a company. I think a lot of people in your position that I've seen build companies very successful doing it. They go out, they start spending money or start giving money away, thinking that they're good at giving advice or money or combination of the both. And they absolutely fail at it. So what makes you a good investor? Oh, I don't, I don't think I would be a good investor. This is how you're going to spend your money, by the way. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. It, to me, it's, you look at it as philanthropy, not investment. Interesting. I do think that there's a way to be a successful angel investor. And I don't have the... It's possible that I could become that. I don't know. I just honestly don't know. It'd be interesting to try. But I think you'd have to go into it thinking that, that it's okay if it doesn't. I don't even know if I want to try. So I think it's more like... Because you have to have the best deal flow. You have to see all the flow. I know it sounds like Trump, but you do have to have the best deal flow of the other angels because you have to see the good ones. You know, you can't just have the, the leftovers after the people went to the people they really want. There has to be some reason why you can, you can change the risk profile of the company, whether that's, I mean, it's not going to be advice about how to do AdWords, but it could be, it could be advice around thinking strategically about the market, about the next round of financing, helping them find a, a really great, the first really great executive in some specific area that helps the business. There are areas like that where maybe that can materially affect the business. That certainly happened here at WP Engine. Our A round investor, Silverton, helped us find some of our initial executives once we were at three or four years in where we needed that, where it was, you know, too early and you're not ready for that. But when you're ready, 
it makes all the difference. And, and we just got some phenomenal folks who are still here and then continue to grow out the team from there. And there's no way we would have the success we had today if it wasn't for that team that all started with Silverton connecting those dots. So I've personally seen that be very material. That's, so that's what I mean as an example of being materially helpful. I think I would go into it thinking with a different set of goals, though. I, would, I think I'd go into it thinking, I want to have fun. I want to work with people who I like working with. I want to support companies whose mission I like. So if that's a social business, for example, then good. And if that social business has a lower investment profile, who cares? Because I can invest whatever I want. <laughs> I'm not, there's no, I don't have to report back to anybody. I think those would be the kinds of criteria, even though I do think actually a lot of that stuff is correlated with good investments. I actually do think there's some data there. But I wouldn't go into it thinking, I'll fail if I don't get X return in Y years of these normal ways that you think about it. I think that would be a, a, a failure. And in fact, I would even go so far as to say, there's already plenty of money that thinks that way. And so actually what, what the world does not need is yet another investor that thinks that way. You need an investor that thinks a different way. And I'm not saying like, oh, I'm so different. Not that it's so different. If it's a little bit different, then that's good because everyone else is on only one track. There's these new paradigms. Yeah, like Indie VC. Dan, just to cut in here, this is what happens sometimes is you get so excited talking about something that you don't explain it to everybody that's listening. So I just wanted to explain. IndieVC is a venture capital firm. And basically what venture capital firms do is they provide money for startups a lot of times. But IndieVC is a little bit different. So there's the bootstrap world, which you and I live in, and then there's the funded world, which is the venture capital world. And a lot of these companies that are starting these days, at least the ones that are, quote, famous that you see on television, they're venture-backed. That means that they have a bunch of money, they have a bunch of resources, and a lot of times they're making zero money. <laughs> it's kind of this weird thing that exists now that companies can be so well-capitalized but not be making any money. And that's because they're on a different model. They're on the model to sell eventually, whereas a lot of bootstrap companies are not on the model to sell. They're on the model of let's make the founders money. Let's have this be a sustainable business. And NDVC is somewhere in between. NDVC is a venture capital firm. They do provide money, but they don't have the same expectations that most venture firms have. So I just want to pop in and explain that. And Jason and I will go on to talk a little bit more about NDVC. In fact, one of the things I thought might be interesting is to steal their playbook. Go out, talk to them and say, hey, maybe I could run NDVC Austin. I mean, I never talked to them. It's not like they would, <laughs> I'm just making this up, right? But if you asked, like, if you had a magic wand and what would you do, like, that could be kind of interesting because I do think their model is pretty interesting. It'd be interesting to see, is it working? Because it's an experiment. But let's suppose it's working. That could be a model that I would get excited about. Austin doesn't have a model like that. Could that be a good marriage of being able to do the interesting stuff and putting my own money in and all that and helping Austin grow and all that, you know, kind of legacy stuff, but in a structure that's new? That could be really interesting. I do think that you need, that the investor has to make some kind of money because otherwise it's not sustainable. Otherwise, the money goes away and it's the end. Yeah, so you have this philosophy, and I think, like you mentioned, IndieVC probably shares some of it too, which is it's kind of this weird hybrid, right? Like It sounds like you believe that you should start off bootstrapped and then maybe raise some funding, maybe not raise some funding. And so you know, bringing that philosophy, I think, to the mainstream is a, it's an interesting idea. Specifically, what I think is this. I think there's a gap between the bootstrap company and the company that raises even a, a small seed round. Because this, even the small seed round sets you up to like, oh, now you have to exit for a lot of money and you're down this path of raising money. The thing with bootstrapping only, and again, that is what I did four times, so that's that's my MO. You know, Looking back on that and also looking at what we did at WP Engine having raised money is it's so hard. You're so constrained that I think a lot of businesses that could be great businesses Maybe not billion dollar businesses, but businesses that could make five million a year, ten million a year, fifteen million a year, none of which is interesting to the raise money crew. That's way too small, so no. But a lot of those businesses that could live die an early death because bootstrapping is too hard. Because even just five K a month for ads, plus another developer, plus one other person, just that could easily make the difference between a business succeeding and failing. So putting in millions and millions and millions of dollars and needing millions, no, not that. That already exists. But the idea that you have like a right-sized amount of money and you don't, and the investor doesn't need some stupid outsized return and therefore have weird pressures that are against the interests of the business, is there a middle ground where you can put in some money so that companies have a better shot? But it's still a bootstrapping mentality. It doesn't get you down this road where everything changes, the goals change, the incentives change, so that everything's different. It doesn't trigger that. 
but it's a little bit less risky than bootstrapping so that these companies that ought to exist, that deserve to exist, exist. That is what I would like to do specifically. Now, if Indie VC might be that because they have an interesting model where that may be true. So if Indie VC is a model in which I can do what I just said, I would be interested. If not, I might have to try to invent something. And again, I have no idea if I can. I do not, I will not tell you that I'm sure I can. I'm not that confident, but I do think it would be worthy and worthwhile to try to do that because I think it's a worthwhile cause. (laughs) Jason, just one more question, then I'll let you get going with your day. And this is kind of to wrap things up and all related. Practitioner versus preacher. You told me um, that you have 400 unpublished blog posts. And uh, I think there's a lot of people that want to read those, even if they're not done. So, you know, we're talking about how you spend your time running WP Engine. We're talking about advising people. We're talking about writing blogs. Where are you today? on that line. I mean, what I'm looking at now is you're in your office. So you're, you're obviously a practitioner. Is that 90% of the time you're a practitioner? Or oh yeah. That's where they're in draft. If I was preaching, they, they'd be published. <laughs> Tell me about when you go back and forth between the two and how that works for you. Is that something that's structured or do you just find yourselves in times of reflection? It's not structured, but it probably would be smarter if it were, because definitely I believe in the idea that teaching others helps you absorb and learn and be better. So I think it's wise to do both. It would probably be better if I set aside half a day a week for, I don't know, writing or something like that, going over to Capital Factory and talking to companies because everyone's doing new stuff. You get new ideas and the energy that comes from there. Like that would actually probably be wiser. So that's what I should do. Okay, this was a trick question. If you so, I'm I'm getting I'm talking you into finishing these blog posts because <laughs> yeah. you do have one of the best blogs that I read. So, well, thanks so much. Well, that was that was actually the origin of WP Engine because I kept getting on Hacker News every Monday when I published. Now I don't publish so often, but I published every Monday f- for years. I get on Hacker News and the blog would crash due to traffic, and so I called up other blogger friends and said, "Hey, I don't care if it's fifty dollars a month or a hundred dollars a month." It can't be a thousand dollars a month, but it doesn't need to be five dollars a month. I just need the blog to stay up. What do you guys use for WordPress? And the answer was always, I don't know, but if you find it, tell me because I need that. Wait, this was the actual Genesis story yeah. of WP Engine. So then, then I thought, huh, that's interesting. Now, of course, a germ of an idea is not necessarily a business, right? We all know this. So then I had converted into customer development, and so I did fifty five zero customer interviews, trying to suss out like, mm, would someone pay fifty dollars for WordPress hosting, and if so, what would that need to entail for them to do it? And so, after all those interviews, which took months, right, it takes a lot of time, I concluded that if you made it fast, secure, scale under traffic, and if the tech support crew answered WordPress questions and didn't just say the server was up like the infrastructure companies will do, then people would pay fifty dollars a month for that. So that was the origin, and the first plan was $49, and, and that's where WP Engine came from. And part of your uh, philosophy is interviewing your customers, and you're super passionate about that. And I think that that's a really, really important thing to do, and it's probably the most uncomfortable thing you can do in a business is actually say, hey, how are we doing? And you're like, oh, shit, don't tell me the truth, tell me the truth. But it's interesting to hear that that was how you started WP Engine. Yeah, too often, especially before there's a product or before there's a company, you're doing those initial ones, as opposed to the sort of follow-ons, like we already have a product and we're trying to find out what's next. Those are a little easier to hear. The hardest ones is at the very beginning where you want so badly for your idea to be right and good and for this to be a business that often the customer interview is really a sales pitch. You're essentially convincing them that this is a good idea. Of course, as a passionate and intelligent person, you probably can convince somebody that it's a pretty good idea after 45 minutes of talking to them. You probably could do that. That'd be a long sales letter. <laughs> yeah, of course you've learned nothing. You haven't validated a single thing, but you know you feel good because the other person at the end of the call said, well, that sounds pretty good. That's a fallacy that happens a lot. Another fallacy is not asking about price. A lot of people will take something or be somewhat interested until they find out it's $50 a month and suddenly they're not interested. That's key to seeing whether there's really value that they'll pay for and not just, uh, oh, that sounds cool. That sounds like a neat product. The difference between that and I will in fact part with money, when can I have it? There's a lot of the former and not a lot of the latter, so you got to ask that. Question for you, boss man. Yes. What do you have to add to that? Oh, man. Really? I'm going to follow Jason Cohen up. 
It was hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll sum it up. Jason Cohn is a finalist in the all-time greatest bloggers contest, which I'm currently running, and I plan to do a future episode about. You can check out his submission, which is his body of work at blog.asmartbear.com. Jason is the founder of WP Engine. Check that out as well. And we're super grateful that he swung by the show to share his thoughts, as well as speaking at our conference at DC Austin. And we're going to post the show notes and links and everything to this one tropicalmba.com slash Jason Cohen. That's where you can leave your thoughts on this show. Nice. Thanks a lot, Jason, for being on the show. And thank you, Dan. And we will see you next week. Cheers. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.